Hi. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, my name is Amy Whitaker, and I'm uh, humbled and honored to introduce John Maida, the president of the Rhode Island School of Design, um, here to talk to us about his new book um, that he wrote with Becky Bermont, also of RISD. Um, you may be thinking, gosh, she doesn't look familiar. Um, and unless you saw me taking a free soda earlier, I do not actually work at Google. But I, I'm lucky to be here. I happen to be in San Francisco this weekend to teach. And uh, Simon Pyle, who's in the audience, told me that John was here to speak. Um, I spoke in the author program two years ago and met John very shortly thereafter um, on a fluke elevator introduction um, that my boss made to John at the TED conference um, and was subsequently invited uh, into the RISD family um, to speak uh, to the freshman class there and also to get to know John and his team. And what I really want to say by, by way of introduction is that, um, like many people here, um, John is a, a technologist, but also uh, one with pathos and, and real generosity and a kind of incredible team of people around him. Um, one of, I've been fortunate to see him present about his fine artwork, and one of his early works that I happen to love was a reprogramming of a computer program so that instead of the cursor moving, you moved and everything moved around the cursor. And I think the way that John writes um, similarly has the effect of shifting my own worldview. And I think he has a particular gift um, for a kind of simplicity um, that is really um, fundamentally based around people. Um, it doesn't take the human element out, um, but allows it to sort of shine through. And um, I also think you know, in being a master of technology, um, you could define technology incredibly broadly, um, not just Twitter, which I think John has turned into a form of poetry, seriously, um, but also something like cheese pizza as the one technology that gets college students um, all together. Um, so I, I really am uh, very humbled to have the, uh, the role reversed and to be able to introduce John. Um, and I know we're all very lucky um, to hear him speak. So thank you for having me as a, as a guest for lunch, and um, uh, thank you for having John speak to all of us. Thank you. I want to thank Amy for that nice introduction. Uh, it really is interesting because uh, I guess just a couple years ago I was introducing you to our freshman class. Um, what happened is I really was on an elevator in Long Beach, and I had a new acquaintance tell me that there was someone out there that understood how to combine uh, her own uh, fine arts background with her business background and speak in the language of art, speak in the language of finances with artistic integrity and financial integrity. And Amy most recently was in Occupy Wall Street teaching uh, different people about financial literacy. Um, she makes me think about how Occupy Wall Street is more about understanding Wall Street and her work really embodies that, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, I'm delighted to be here because I spoke in this same spot some years ago, which I can't remember anymore. Um, Google is a company that I've always admired. Um, Google is a company that has some of the best people in the world uh, on hire. Guys like Bradley Horowitz over there, uh, my hacking buddy, uh, back when we were grad students, uh, back when the, the Sun workstation was the hottest thing around. And uh, those memories are very fond to, to us, I know. Um, and I also have a, a friend over there, Karen Cabot, who is a new hire here, actually at YouTube, who's a RISD student. Uh, just like last year, she graduated, of course, she's no longer a RISD student, uh, was a senior graduate. Um, but she's very uh, interesting because Karen is someone I found uh, uh, on the internet in my own college. Like, who is this person? Oh, she's a, a senior, and she's in one of my dorms, and she's broadcasting videos about design. And who is she? And so I reached out to Karen, and we've become uh, best buds. That's really, very exciting as well. Um, now, why am I here today? Um, well, I'm here in general to talk about uh, the importance, the relevance of art and design in our country the opportunities afforded by thinking about where creativity can come from, from an authentic source. Uh, it, is so, it is a topic that um, is not as exciting, perhaps, as the latest technology, uh, yet it has a kind of substance that I think that in the end 
uh, we all are looking for, that we hunger for, we can't name it. It is, in many cases, art and design is thought of as a nice to have. Nice to have. That's very pretty. That's great. How wonderful. Nice to have. But it really is a need to have. Something that you all know. You all love design. You wear things. You buy things. You sit in them. You make them. Art and design matters to all of you. It just isn't in the foreground. And I'm asking you all today to think about what is that thing you are around you? Art and design, I believe. Now, how did this happen for me to care about this? Well, I did intimate that I was uh, Bradley Horowitz's hacking buddy. And uh, I went to MIT, uh, computer science. Uh, my master's was in device physics. And I was at a media lab for a while. And um, computers were my world. And I had the fortune of that world getting broken for different reasons. First of all, a reason from being a child. As a child, I was good at art and mathematics. And my teacher at a parent-teacher conference told my father this, John is good at art and mathematics. And my father said to everyone afterwards, you know, John is good at math. <laughs> and that's kind of how it began and how it evolved. I went to MIT and um, somehow I found a way to escape from technology I found a way to escape from that wonderful world that I was living with Bradley in the, the Hacking Cove and went to art school afterwards to sort of uh, reprogram or deprogram my brain, really, um, to connect with uh, this thing that we wear. Our brain wears this thing, the body, and finds things, feels things. I remember in art school in Japan, I found it so strange how in my first year as I'm making my different uh, pen ink drawings and um, I'd make a mistake. Make a mistake, I would reach for the undo key with the left hand, corded. Doesn't work. Why not? Because the physical materials um, don't afford that kind of flexibility. They actually require mastery, discipline, rigor, directiveness, which really isn't all that bad. Yeah, this week I gave a talk at uh, Fast Company's Innovation Uncensored uh, a conference with Kevin Lynch, the CTO of Adobe. And the big talk is always about how, you know, you know, computer tools, more access, more creativity, everyone drawing, mouse going to iPad, so much better, so much more access. And I asked the question, well, are things really getting better? Is it much easier to draw on the computer? Is it any easier to draw on a computer than it is to draw on paper? Has it changed over 30 years? It's a question. So as all the talk was about the cloud, I began to ask the question, just like two days ago, about there's the cloud. But what about the dirt? The dirt, the physical world around us that messy world that computes based upon the physics around us. The, the, the stuff that has taste, smell, has humanity, gets old, dies out, comes alive again. I'm curious about the dirt, really. And I found the dirt here in Silicon Valley two days ago, so I'm very happy, actually. Uh, I'm very in with the dirt. Um, so my journey to the dirt uh, has gone in different phases. I got my, uh, I was in art, art school, I got my PhD, I went back to MIT, was a professor there. And as a professor back at MIT, I became a born-again technologist. Uh, someone who was trying to understand, what is this thing, technology? Um, we didn't always have it, and we have it. How do you reconcile the dirt with technology? And um, I was in uh, Rome one year, and you know those beautiful cathedrals in uh, Italy, the beautiful cathedrals with the people on top? And uh, I was looking up in the sky one time, and there was one of the guys up there gesturing. And I thought it's so interesting how when I saw him gesturing, I saw him gesturing against the crane coming towards him. It really wasn't coming towards him. It was a kind of a mistake optically. But in my mind, I saw an image like this, an image of humanity and technology. How do we come into balance, 
how do we understand that relationship, became really a crystallized passion of mine. Now, the nice thing about having so many uh, amazing people in the world is you always find some new idea or some old idea that makes more sense, gives structure, uh, framing to how you're trying to struggle to understand something. This is uh, by Scott Heiferman of uh, meetup.com. Um, and uh, it's something I heard from Scott that made into some diagrams that helped me understand something he said. He was saying how, you know, in the old days you had this thing called life before television. And you had this amazing furniture technology. It was called the coffee table. And you'd sit around it and you would drink coffee and talk with each other. It's a radical idea. And then television was invented and you suddenly assume the position, and you all aim towards it, like the fireplace metaphor we hear so often. We build positions around communication that we began to absorb one way versus two way. And then after the computer, what happened is we had our own personal television or, or interaction space. And I know that any of you who have children, nieces or nephews, know that the house looks like this now. Everybody has their own world, their own micro world, their own different postures, positions in the living room or around the house. And it's a very different life compared to before the TV. Add to that that mobile phones today uh, are essentially the act of shining a computer in your face while you walk. And the world looks like this now. This is the world we live in, a world we take for granted, a world that feels different. But I often ask the question, is it really different? Has it really changed? And when I go back to uh, many people in this room, remember the, when computing came out, um, who had like an Apple II TRS-80 Sinclair, the old computer? You remember you brought it home? You were so excited. You plugged it in. You popped it into your TV. You turned it on. And it did absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> nothing. It did nothing. The text, you type in text, and the first text you get back is, you're wrong. <laughs> Syntax error. That error, text. And then text turned into images later on the computer. It's remarkable. You could see images, first black and white, then color. And then after that, you were able to listen to CD quality sound on your computer. And then CD-ROM technology was brought to us by the aliens. You could suddenly watch movies on your computer, short movies, but movies on your computer. And then the web was invented. Browser, text primarily, small images. Images got bigger, full color. Listening to CD quality sound over the internet. Add to that, next gen, watching video over the internet. Mobile phones come from the sky, text. Later, images, and then streaming sound, an amazing video on your mobile phone. Feels kind of like a, an infinite loop, I think. Makes you wonder, like, are we really stuck in that loop? What does it look like? What are we missing? I believe we're missing a notion of culture and quality, transformation, content on the computer. It just hasn't happened yet, and we're all waiting for it to happen. And we're waiting for technology to make it happen, somehow. You know, technology, everything happens at light speed. But we're people. We don't move at light speed. Different paradigm. How do you combine our paradigm of being people, being humans, with this paradigm of amazing possibility in the computer? It's a question. Now, if there's one thing that I do feel strongly about, it's about time, people, teachers, people get a chance to meet in your life, to change your lives. I'm sure you've all had, who's had a great teacher in their life? Almost everyone here had a teacher. You know, Richard Saul Werman often says that in life, you probably only have one or two good teachers in your entire life. But uh, you get one or two good teachers, people that change your life. And um, I was, uh, visiting the uh, Media Lab uh, two years ago 
when William J. Mitchell, Bill Mitchell as he's known, uh, the dean of architecture, former dean of architecture at MIT, passed away at a very young age. And he was someone we all looked up to as a kind of visionary of not just technology, but design, space, architecture. And at the ceremony, uh, one, of his, one of his old grad students said that Bill Mitchell would always say, blast away at it, get it done. So that energy, that enthusiasm, is what I believe uh, prevails today in every, every younger person. And that's my hope, is how do you activate that around this important theme of creativity in the world, the dirt, seeing the dirt, getting involved in it. Because this time thing is like there. You guys have all taken time out of your day to come and sit down uh, with me, with us. That time doesn't come back. I love how uh, when I worked on the Simplicity book, I was always thinking about how, you know, when you're like a younger person, you have all the time in the world to mess with. You're like, wow, you know, that's really complex, and I'm going to figure that thing out. And it's like, you know, when you're older, you're, you don't want to do that anymore. Because you know you could be doing something else. You have a nice glass of wine in some cases. You want, you want your time to feel different, because really time is all we have. I'm a uh, pupil of time, uh, time as we see it in every city in the world. I think can be uh, defined by the emergency sign. Look at anywhere in the world. The graphics for the sign often embodies the culture. This is how Chicago escape signs look like. The guy knows the fire is there, run away from it. Contrast that with a sign I found in Miami, <laughs> where he's like, ah, oh, I think I'm, I'm carrying my, you know, you know, gin and tonic, whatever, walking down. You know, like, fire's not going to come and get me. I like the French, because the French know how to run away. <laughs> Very effective. But time, how we run away from situations, the time we have on the world, I believe is that thing we're looking for, how do we maximize the uh, uh, outcome of that time. Now, I've been lucky to uh, change my time, uh, or my notion of time, by uh, having gone from the Media Lab to becoming the president of, R of Rhode Island School of Design, the School of Art and Design by which all are measured in the country, and probably in the world as well. Different kind of place. And being in that place, it is really not about technology. It is about humanity, about art and design, the passion around it. it has been a very rewarding experience. Literally life-changing in many ways. In a time of great change. So um, anyone knows that um, you turn the TV on or the media on or you open your browser, the economy looks like this. It looks like it was okay and then it's gotten bad. And then makes you feel bad. And every, wants to make you, every, every politician that wants to make you feel good says, we will turn that curve back upwards. We will make America stronger. It's all going to be better. And how does this curve come back? This curve by education policy people is believed to come back through, in, through innovation policy, education innovation policy, research policy that is usually grounded in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, so-called STEM subjects. STEM subjects uh, govern how education policy in America behaves. We need more math and science to make America stronger. I have to wonder, though, has America always been the STEM country? Look at Singapore, look at Japan, countries with amazing math science output, but have always been questioned for creativity. America has always held the creative notion, the arts at its core. How can we talk about STEM as STEAM instead? How do we add art to the equation? How do we show how the left brain innovation and right brain innovation creates great human experiences, creates real innovation? Now, the frame that I use is being in an art school. And again, not just any art school. Uh, an art school that has produced talent like Dale Chihuly, Gus Van Sant, who did Goodwill Hunting. Uh, most things you see in the world that are very unique, 
uh, tied to somehow our graduates. The Voss water bottle, the T Forte infuser, uh, the Cuisinart. Many iconic things have come from this school, a school that believes that art and design have to be core to the human experience. And many people wonder what happens at such a school. I tell them that design and art happen. And most people have a problem realizing that design and art are different. It's like scientists and engineers, different framing of a same kind of intense space. Designers make solutions. Artists make questions. And what's unique about RISD is it's 50% fine art, 50% design. And it's all about the intersection that makes great things occur. Now, one thing I noticed when I first came to RISD is how everybody is so dirty. Going back to the cloud and the dirt, um, dirty hands everywhere. Uh, hands that want to get into the material, want to mess with it, want to make it their own, want to consume it, and make it express. It's a powerful way of thinking. It's a way that isn't afraid. And everyone's very tired at RISD also. People say that RISD stands for reason I'm sleep deprived. Uh, the passion in display uh, really is similar to the high tech world. People that are making at superhuman levels, uh, their dreams come true. Design and art. Uh, the difference between design and art is not easy to distinguish. Uh, what I have uh, done is built a simple five minute primer uh, for design. If you want a seven minute primer about design, check out Karen Cavett's videos. They're very good. Uh, they're very good design videos. This is my own design video, Karen, so check it out. There we go. Design. So design is about how form and content intermingle. Form being what you see, what you taste with your eyes. Content, what you understand with your mind. Let's begin with this piece of content, the word fear. Fear is a word that no one likes particularly doesn't feel very good, fear. And fear, set in regular Helvetica, looks like that. And if you change the typeface, one grade, to light, it's gotten less fearful. It's so small. I'm OK with that kind of fear. You make the same fear gigantic, and it gets scary again. The change in scale changes how you felt about the content. The form, I said, didn't change. The scale changed. Or change its nature. Go to this typeface, like a pirate typeface, like Captain Jack Sparrow typeface. Arr, fear. It's kind of funny, not as uh, fearful. Or take the word fear and sit into like a nightclub fear typeface, like club fear. Oh, it's great dancing, great music, salsa music, got to go to fear. It changes how you feel about it. Or you take fear and take the letters and let them kind of like huddle together, like on the deck of the Titanic, afraid, playing with space, making more content from the form. Or sit in this kind of like exquisite typeface to make it look like a fear the high-end restaurant. The one you can never get reservations to. Fear the hors d'oeuvres are fantastic. <laughs> that kind of fear exists as well. That is form. Now we look at content. If you change just one letter in that content, the feeling changes. You change fear into free. Free is a much better word than fear. Free. Making it bold, ultra bold, feels very good. It feels Mandela free. It feels powerful, free. It hits you hard. Free, even when it's light set, becomes more like a, a concept, a philosophy. Fear set small and spread out. Feels like a, a kind of a philosophy, air you breathe and you throw in a, 
a blue gradient, and you pop in a dove, <laughs> and you have free the ad. You know, it's like so that's a traveling through form and content. Design shapes how you can feel in a very directed, functional, strategic way. And then there's art. And art is harder than design, which makes it wonderful. Because it makes you wonder. It takes you out of your safety zone. It makes you feel different intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. It may not work at that moment. It may work one year later. That is art. Art is about making questions, making you think, making you wonder. Becoming president as a creative person has been challenging for me because a creative person is always against the man, against the authority. But now, I'm the man, which is quite awkward, quite interesting to me, how to reconcile that, how to understand that in an open frame. When I walk around campus the first few months, I notice all the signs around campus. They weren't my signs. I didn't put them in, but the authority put them in. So I was very curious what I was saying. <laughs> and this sign says, don't put your bicycles here. And as I stood there, I was like, I could put three bicycles here, and it'd be OK. Why am I saying this? And someone had written on the, in chalk, why? I thought it was really interesting. I was like, yeah, why? I don't really get it. And a week later, there was a debate, apparently. Someone tore down the sign. Why? Why not? It happened. So that is art, too. Art is moments that you find that make you ask questions. They aren't solutions, per se. They've taken to you to a place, a place of enigma, a place of discomfort, a place of learning and growth. When I visit exhibitions on RISD campus, I'm always in a state of wonder, just wondering what the question is. In our, our, our glass department, this is a glass uh, show where there were all these glasses that someone had blown and had taken photographs of them. And someone asked me, well, what's the point of that? You can't drink from those glasses. I said, well, that's the point. You're asking a question about those glasses. You're, you're making a, you're trying to understand it. It's an enigma. The artist knows. They're trying to make that happen in, in your mind. This is a ceramic artist. She took her boyfriend and made a, 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 a bust of the top and the middle. Why would she do that to her boyfriend? Why? Artists do that. They make these statements. They make you ask questions through the work. They know exactly what they're doing. They're provoking you to think and wonder. Why does an artist wake up in the morning, a painter, and paint a painting every morning? and puts all 365 paintings on the wall. It's amazing. How's it possible? Artist wakes up in the morning, realizes his bed's too big. This is a perfect size bed. Why aren't beds like this? Why? So artists formulate these questions and make work that are questions, make us wonder. You know exactly what they're doing? They're making us making questions so we can ask questions around it, too. The thing about going to business school is you realize that that stuff doesn't work sometimes. So everything is best in a chart. I realize that, too. So I have a, an illegal chart to explain artists and designers. I say illegal because people who aren't in the box can't fit boxes. So disclaimer. Um, so the difference between designer versus an artist, I say a designer thinks like an engineer, an artist thinks like a scientist, asterisk, but they're better dressed. A designer, the audience is important. And for the artist, the audience is completely optional. For a designer, the theme is relevant. For an artist, the theme is free. 
for designer, the outcome has to be producible. For an artist, it just has to be imaginable. For a designer, is driven by pragmatism, and an artist is driven by passion. You can argue that any good artist and designer crosses these sides both, in both ways, and a good scientist and engineer crosses those boundaries all the time. There are statements of how people think creatively from different viewpoints, different poles. Now, art to me is like kite flying, kite making. I had, um, in my early days at MIT, I taught a class uh, on Java when Java first came out, making kites out of Java. And this is a early kite, that a shockwave kite. And this is a kite flown from the view of the kite. And I think that artists do this. They make kites. They make the wind that is invisible become visible, become flyable, become enjoyable, become understandable. So this kite flying aspect of artists is something to notice. Uh, and you can see it. As a president who's also an artist, I also look to art as a way to understand my own role as a, kite, as a kite flyer myself, or I try to do that as much as I can. So in February, I had an exhibition in London, in Soho area, at a gallery called Rifle Maker, which is uh, the, uh, it's an old rifle making shop from the 1700s. There are no weapons made anymore, but uh, it's an old gallery space, two-story gallery space. And I have two friends who own this gallery, and they asked me to have a show. And I said, well, I can't do that. I'm just too busy. I can't make any work. And they said, oh, don't worry. Just show up. And we'll make a sand pit for you to sit in. It'll be great. <laughs> and I said, OK. And that's how it was uh, launched, really. And for this show, I took some of my old uh, I made, um, I used to make little circuit board computers, uh, little one-offs, and I had all these old boards I hadn't used, and so I had a Saturday where I wired things together, not wired in that way, just made some little sculptures that I photographed, uh, little different scenes of life, I made seven of them, here are three of them, first one is called Family, this is a, a kind of a moment of a, of a single father, and their son, uh, his son, about to make his, take his first steps. That exciting moment of uh, joy in someone's lonely, lonely life. It's about to happen. It's a pregnant moment. This is a more breezy piece. It's a, it's a guy in a park with his cell phone and his dog. Just like walking through the park, walking his dog, has a fancy dog has a cool mobile phone, it's kind of big, <laughs> and talking. And this piece is about CEO-ness. This is the, uh, the CEO behind the desk of power with the empty seats, waiting for someone to come in to talk with, connect with, create new options, um, have a meeting, essentially. And I, when I got to London, I used this as the basic theme uh, with my friend's idea of the sand pit. Because what happens is that they had scheduled for anyone to come and talk to me for six minutes, for four days straight, back to back. I lost my voice, like I'm losing my voice now this time. I was in a sand pit, small room, unheated, February, and people would sit across from me. We'd be alone in a room. It was kind of scary at first, you know. But it was, just, it was isolated space. They would sit down and just talk to me. I wasn't sure how to use a sand pit, but I thought, a sand pit I could draw in. So I began to draw on it. It's a great medium for drawing. It is really the, the cloud the dirt, the sand. And I realized as, I, as after I would draw something, I could stamp out the, the, the writing. Like an Etch-a-Sketch, 
flip it upside down, erase the letters. I talk to someone, they would talk to me, I would draw on the sand, we would talk some more, they would leave, and as they're leaving, I'm stamping out the sand for the next person. And what happened was very interesting. Um, I had no idea who was going to come, no expectation who was coming. People from all ages came, from all backgrounds came. I had uh, over a hundred visitors come to sit and talk. There were very open conversations. There was a, a person who had come to, uh, uh, she had just finished her SAT equivalents in the UK. What should she do? What should she major in? There was an artist who had three months left to live, want to know what sculptures he should partake before he dies. There was a young, actually there was a middle-aged manager who was about to change jobs and have a new team. In his current job, he believed he wasn't a good manager. How could he motivate his new team? There were so many varieties of people that I met and saw in this experiment in this performance piece, which I'm not sure what it was supposed to be. But what it became is realizing how, as a leader, your job is not to lead, per se, but to connect and to organize and make real connections between people and hope for the best. So for instance, I'd have one person sit down and say, you know, I'm a I, I, I would like to become a curator someday, a curator, an arts curator. How do I do that? And I could tell her in this case, well, seven seats ago, in that same seat, sat Hans Ulrich Obrist, the top curator in Europe. And she looked straight back at the chair, and she had to wipe it on her. She said, I want to wipe this on myself a little bit, you know? It's kind of nice. Like, I want to, I want to carry some of those feelings. Someone had this great idea. Another person was looking for a thesis topic. So connecting people, hoping they'll find each other, being someone that can perhaps make that happen. And why this matters to me, and all to all of us today, is this very real uh, disruption of not just technology and, and everything else like that. It's a disruption of the organization and how it's supposed to work. We all know it, we all feel it, experts study it. We used to have a very orderly model of the world. The model looked something like this. There was a, a very clear organizational hierarchy where you had layers of people. You don't get to talk to the president. You talk through four levels to get there. That's how it should be. This is how it works. You work in the same place for your lifetime. You will gradually get there to the top. These models, these very stable models, have been disrupted by the new technology of social mediation, such that the network, the, the tree that we once had, has now become this organizational network, where now the CEO can be friended by the factory line worker, where anyone can, can, can friend across any organization. It doesn't make much sense anymore. It's, it's become this, uh, this network has become a very disorganized network. And it's confusing for many. I was um, at the World Economic Forum's uh, uh, Council's uh, uh, session in Abu Dhabi, where one topic was about how the middle manager in corporations used to serve a function of knowledge control. But now because of computers and information sharing, that role is not as strong as it used to be. Uh, I said this to a representative of the Korean government who said, oh, you're right, because the ambassadors of each country used to control all the connections. But now because of Google and things like that, anyone can find out what their country does. So the entire middle layer, middle layer is becoming decimated, becoming less relevant. It's a different time. It's a curious time. Um, you know, I was at um, the Department of Transportation, and I was asked, uh, what is the most vital thing that every CEO president should be concerned about? 
My answer was human resources. Human resources is that part, the human part of, a, of an organization. It's what defines the relationships, the sense of safety, um, learning. Because right now, as the middle layer collapse, collapses, the mentoring function the middle, layer, the middle layer served is now vanishing. So no other time have things like learning, personal development, human development been more important. And acknowledging this network, it isn't, as you know, how many networks, how many connections you have. It's how do you attenuate the network? How do you own the connections in the network? How do you have the fat and the thin connections in the network? This is an open question. It isn't how we used to operate. It's a great question that we all get to work on in this generation, because we have time to do it. So I've uh, written uh, with Becky Vermont uh, about this idea of creative leadership, how to rethink it. Not only really think it, it's not a new idea. How do you take ideas from creative people, artists and designers, and embed them in the practice of managing, of leading? Because there's, there, there are really two kinds of leaders, the traditional leader and the creative leader. You have a very creative leader here at Google. It's, a, it's an anomaly to have such a leader. A traditional leader and creative leader can be compared. I have a chart. This chart's on creative leader, creativeleadership.com. A traditional leader can be the symbol of authority, whereas a creative leader is a symbol of inspiration. A traditional leader is about yes or no. Someone who's creative, though, is comfortable with ambiguity. Maybe is an okay thing. A traditional leader is about being right, whereas a creative leader is concerned with being real, a real person. A traditional leader loves to avoid mistakes, whereas someone who's creative loves to learn from mistakes. Oh, great, we failed. Let's figure out how we failed. Let's learn from it. Let's do a critique. Let's grow and grow beyond. A traditional leader wants to be right. A creative leader acknowledges how complex the situation is and hopes to be right. Just hope, I hope I'm right. For a traditional leader, your opinion matters. For a creative leader, how are you feeling about it? How does it make you feel? Are important things. Because the person part matters so much to a creative person. And I've been able to find this in the DNA of art and design. Because when I came on board to RISD, I thought that I would meet every graduate of RISD, and I would go and see them, and I would find all these artists and designers. I found many artists, artists, many designers, but I found a wide spectrum of people that covered every territory. Uh, one of our graduates is one of the top uh, intellectual property lawyers in the country. We have the CEO of Airbnb, Silicon Valley startup. So we have a variety of types of people coming from an art and design background, which I find quite fascinating. It points to a paradigm that can exist more, art and designers taking a role in that world. Some of you may have seen this, ac this acronym. It's V-U-C-A. It's by Bob Johansson at the Insti Institute of the Future. It's called VUCA. Uh, Bob talks about how the world has become VUCA. It's become volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, which doesn't feel really, really good. But as you know, that's how the world does feel. He talks about an anti-VUCA, a VUCA to combat that. It looks like this. It looks like visioning, understanding, clarity, and agility. All attributes of creative practice, of free, risk-taking creative practice. And why should that matter? It matters because uh, I have this hierarchy that was given to me by uh, a nurse practitioner named Patty Brennan of creativity. It goes in four layers. 
Reflex, which is devoid of creativity, response to stimuli. Problem solving, moving up in the chain. You have an issue, solve a problem, work around it. Creativity, making new ideas, synthesizing. And at the very top, imagination. Free, pure uh, uh, creativity. And how, what happens in day-to-day -day work, in leading or managing, working in general, is that you're usually down here. Reflex and problem solving. The question is, how do you get up there? How do you get up there and find your creative potential and unlock it? I believe it comes from the creative practice of art and design, how to find that connection to your daily lives. And recently, going back to the original theme of STEM, from the STEM to STEAM, I've been noticing that in science and in technology for a long time that scientists are looking for ways to break paradigms, to find new ways to discover, imagine, innovate. This was from Times Magazine's Time 100 list. Uh, Dr. David Ho, uh, an, an AIDS researcher. And I loved how he isn't using a stick and ball molecule model. He's using clay and dye. He's going off road to discover, to find. He's getting his hands dirty. He's getting his hands into the dirt. And recently at RISD, we've been fortunate to have more scientists and engage with this kind of work. The National Science Foundation in a STEM to STEAM workshop on campus, bringing experts from America to bring science and art together. Because I believe that art can lead science to not just beauty, but discovery as well. And that goes vice versa. Science can lead art the same way as it always has happened, yet calling it out. I believe is critical right now as we seek to innovate ourselves into the future. Things we know, for, things we know of this category so, so commonly. Infoviz, a combination of technology and visual art. Understanding things. We had the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation fund a healthcare and art symposium on RISD, where students made all kinds of propaganda to talk about healthcare reform. There were movies, there were sculptures, there were posters, there were even textiles. That was weird. So it's kind of like fun. Oh. <laughs> when people wonder if this is a fact that art and design are an important part of uh, product development, look to the car industry in the 50s. America defined its car industry through design, through differentiation, making it have feeling, not just machines. Look to 21st century, look to Apple, example of taking something like a digital audio player, the MP3 players, that nobody really wanted, and made them desirable, made them human, made them passionate, built an ecosystem of desire, of design, rather than art. And so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we're wondering how do we add, how do we pop into that middle Steam, art. This is the question we're trying to ask right now at RISD. We now have a variety of activities in this area. Uh, we have a House resolution in Congress right now uh, that, is, uh, that is supporting the idea in the America Competes Act to inject art into STEM education legislation nationally. If you're a Californian, please no notify your congressman or congressperson to get involved with this um, House resol resolution. And uh, you know, in all this press about Steve Jobs, I loved how in one New York Times article, there was this phrase that said, CEOs like Jobs won't come from business or engineering schools, period. There's no punchline. So I believe that more CEOs, leaders, managers, will adopt uh, the art and design frame, the anti-VUCA frame, the creativity frame, the agility frame, which I believe is the next generation of leaders. I am done now. Uh, if you want to know more about STEM to STEAM, go to stemtosteam.org. I want to thank you for your attention. And now I have a q and I believe. Is that correct, Candice? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, John. Um, so who's the most inspirational leader you worked with and why? 
Oh. Um, the question of who is the most inspirational leader that I work with and why? That's a tough question. Isn't it? That's a good question. Um, I think that the best leader I ever had in that case was Paul Rand. Uh, Paul Rand was the, uh, uh, the uh, amazing graphic designer. He did the IBM logo, uh, Westinghouse, UPS, ABC. He's uh, Papa Logo, essentially. Um, I met him when he, when he was 81. And what was nice about meeting him and knowing him was that um, I was at his studio for the day. I'd arrived from Japan just to see this person. And um, he said to me, you know, my assistant couldn't come in today. So you have to work today all day for free for me. He was a stranger to me. I didn't know him. I said, sure, why not? And so I sat down and I worked on his book, his last book. And I came to the design field because I found his book in the library at MIT. So it was a very weird moment. And that day I was working on his last book, which is a wonderful kind of like connection of life. But I'll never forget how in his studio, when his wife came in, he would just sort of hug her, you know? And when I drove him somewhere once in the car, he held her hand all the way. And why is that relevant? It's relevant because I believe that Leaders are something amazing, something passionate, something human that uh, I've always respected. I can never forget. It definitely was Paul Wren. It was an icon to me. Next question. Yes. I think when we think about uh, STEM and politicians talk about STEM, it's, you know, it's one about kind of economic viability, but two about the actual jobs that are created and, yes. for example, what you're going to earn. If you, if you study hard, become an engineer, you're probably going to be able to earn a decent amount of money. You're going to be able to take care of a family. When you look at a more of an art track, it's, it's unclear. You know, you, you had a, that great diagram where you showed a lot of people can go into painting and sculpture, but there are some other, they can be great IP lawyers, et cetera, but it's not as clear of a path. How do you, do you think people just have to be more comfortable with taking a more circuitous route in life to end up with that great paying job that can support a family? Or how would you frame that differently, potentially? Oh, thank you. It's um, a great question. I heard it described as how artists choose, you know, we have a linear path. Artists choose a jagged career path, uh, a career path that is flexible, that has to change. And I think in the past, it did lead to difficulty of monetization of talent. But things as we know today, like Kickstarter or Etsy or Quirky or all these sites, are enabling creativity to permeate and become monetizable. I find that exciting. A lot of my work on campus is connecting those companies into RISD. But I believe that that work exists. Creativity is manifest. But I believe that creative thinking is actually where the real action is going to grow. I see it in companies like Google that are thirsting for innovation, looking for it. Um, they are the next employers of this kind of talent, I believe. Not in their, not in their design divisions, in the engineering divisions, in their HR divisions. Uh, adopting that frame is important, I believe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.